This is episode 297 of Jumble Think. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome to Jumble Think, where we interview dreamers, makers, innovators, and influencers all about their journey of turning dreams and ideas into reality. Along the way, we're going to share some tips on how you can turn your own dreams and ideas into reality, too. Our guest on today's show is Tim Campos. More about Tim in a moment. Whether you're a new listener or a longtime fan, if you've never subscribed to Jumble Think, you should go do it right now. How do you do it? Head on over to your favorite podcast app, places like Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Pandora, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, well, pretty much anywhere. Search for JumbleThink and click subscribe. That way you can catch up on past episodes and never miss another episode of JumbleThink. Now let's jump into today's conversation with Tim Campos. Hey there, welcome to JumbleThink. My name is Michael Woodward. I am your host and we have a killer conversation with Tim Campos coming at you in a few moments. Before we dive into that, we are only a couple episodes into season four. We are working hard at bringing some killer conversations to you in 2020 to continue what we've already done in season four. Earlier in the week, we had Natalie Coughlin on the show. She has been in three Olympics where she's won a total of 12 medals. She is the first woman to swim the 100 meter backstroke in under a minute. Crazy, crazy career in swimming. She's doing some exciting new things with a, a winery she started and a cookbook she's released. And she's just recently returned to the world of competitive swimming after having her first child. A, a, a really cool conversation. And if you missed it, you should go check it out. I know I really enjoyed the conversation and I think you will too. Now, today's conversation is with Tim Campos. Tim is the former CIO, that's Chief Information Officer of Facebook. He did that from 2010 to 2016. Now he is the CEO of a company he founded called Woven. They are looking at how we manage calendars, collaboration, and productivity on uh, in our lives, not only in our lives, but with our teams and with our companies. It's a super fascinating conversation as uh, he's really studied this and how we can be better at being more productive. Not only did we talk about that, but we also talked about how we can build better apps for our customers. We also talk about leadership and we go deep into the world of technology and how it integrates into community, our lives, and our responsibility of how we can engage better with our technology. He also gives us a sneak peek behind the curtain of Facebook to let us know a little bit more about what they're thinking about, how they process ideas. It's a really fun conversation. Well, let's go ahead and jump into today's conversation with Tim Campos. Tim, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me here. I'm excited to have this conversation. You have a lot of experience in the world of tech, and you're doing some really innovative stuff. We love innovation. We love ideas. So excited to have you along for the ride today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Happy to talk about uh, my uh, experience and uh, stuff that I've done in the past and what what I'm doing now. Nice. Now, you've been CIO of... Facebook, you are the CEO of Woven. I want to back up, though, before we dive into some of those things and and the exciting things that you've worked on and what you're doing now. I want to back up and hear how you got involved in technology, how you got passionate about technology. How far back should we go? Well, I always like (laughs) spark moments. So what was kind of that spark, that first spark where you were like, hey, technology, the world of code, the world of apps, the world of, of web, it looks pretty appealing to me yeah so um probably the the initial moment was uh way 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 back i'm gonna date myself it's a little embarrassing in 1981 when my father brought home an ibm pc wow um how old do you think you were i was what eight years old then okay and um he, uh, my dad had always had technology in his laboratory. He's a college professor. And, um, so I was always exposed to it. And the PC was the first time that it came into the home. Um, and that, you know, gave me the opportunity to learn about software and, and, uh, you know, gaming and, and stuff like that. But where it got really bad is, um, you know, within a few years I had this 
just natural tendency to love to take things apart. Okay. So, you know, I get the screwdriver kit and I take apart the clock radio or I <laughs> you know, take apart, you know, my toys or whatever. And I took apart the PC one day and oh. my father came home and the PC was strewn in pieces all over the place. Power supply, motherboard, and uh, graphics card and all that kind of stuff. And he was really horrified uh, that I had destroyed. Because, you know, back then I think uh, it was like three or $4,000 for a PC, which – you know, index for inflation was quite a bit. Um, it was pretty expensive. Uh, and I, I didn't have as good of a track record of putting things back together as I did at taking them apart. Mm. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> but I did successfully get it back together. And that kind of began my, my curiosity and interest in technology. From that point forward, I, I, I knew I was going to be an engineer. I, I was born in 1981, so a few years younger than you. But I remember that evolution of technology, how it rapidly changed, how it uh, shaped kind of how we viewed the world and how we communicated. You've been, as as your career, been able to be on the front rows of that transformation. So talk to us a little bit about your journey in, well, from a, a passion for technology into a career of technology. Yeah. I mean, it started pretty early. Um, I, uh, in high school, I, I worked in my father's lab, always doing technology things. Uh, I worked with a, a faculty member at UCSF who was doing a longitudinal study on uh, emotion. Oh, wow. And uh, to do this study, um, UC Berkeley had this uh, study that started in the 30s and went into the 70s, where for a generation they interviewed the same people um, about their lives and they transcribed these interviews. Um, and uh, so they were typewritten. And what this faculty member was doing this was back in 1989 was he wanted to digitize these things um, and then uh, basically do text analysis to understand how emotion shifted with time. Wow. And, uh, it was amazing. Like I said, this is in the eighties, uh, you know, 25, almost 30 years later, we're, we're doing some of the same thing at Facebook at, uh, uh, at scale, but, um, you know, over a shorter period of time because of the, the, the lifespan of Facebook. But anyways, going back to, uh, this, uh, this project, you know, there's a whole bunch of technical problems you have to solve. How do you digitize all this stuff? So we had optical character recognition, which back in 1989 was a very, very new technology. And we had word processing and had to go up and clean up the data. And, um, so I, I learned a lot about automation and how to do things, um, uh, in, in part because I'm lazy. I don't like to do a lot of repetitive work. <laughs> right. And that, that worked out very successfully for me. Late, later on, when I was in uh, college at Berkeley, I um, got an internship at a database company called Sybase. And um, they hired me to do probably the most boring technical job in the company, which was to cut bug fixes for customers. And, um, you know, it was a job that, you know, it was very manual. It took about a day uh, to do all the bug fixes um, each day. And I found ways to automate my job so that I could get it done in about 15 minutes. Wow. And then I had the rest of the day to screw around, <laughs> do other, other things. Uh, and as Sybase was growing, you know, the bug, bug volume was getting larger and larger and larger. So every day was a new record in terms of things that I had to, uh, to cut. But, uh, uh, you know, I was able to do that job in, literally in my sleep. Uh, and that just led to other things, uh, you know, more, uh, responsibilities, more opportunities to code and use technology to solve problems. And uh, that internship never ended. It was a summer internship that uh, wow. turned into a full-time job. And uh, you know, when I graduated, I had uh, tons and tons of work experience uh, at a fantastic company, which uh, really helped launch the next phase of my career. Speaking of that, you, you end up working at Facebook as the CIO. How, how'd you end up at Facebook? It's kind of an interesting story. It, it's actually a, a story about the social graph. Um, I, uh, I was uh, in business school uh, when I had applied for the job at Facebook. And I really only applied to Facebook because I thought it was an interesting company to go see from the inside. But I didn't yeah. care, that, care that much whether they hired me. And um, 
uh, sent my resume in and, and they looked at my background and they're, they're like, you know, KLA 10 core, you know, your, your background is right. For me. And I completely rejected that. I'm like, you're, you're looking at the wrong thing guys. Mm. Uh, you know, my background, KLA 10 core is not indicative of it. It is, uh, sort of the exception. I'm really spent my life in, uh, early stage and very innovative companies like Sybase and Silicon Graphics and startup. And anyway, so we got through that. Um, but where uh, th- things started to click was the hiring manager's wife was the VP of HR of a company whose CEO was the CEO of the startup I was in. <laughs> <laughs> Great relationship and connection there. Yeah, so <laughs> all these different levels of interaction. And uh, so the hiring manager calls the CEO up and says, hey, are you, uh, do you know anything about this Tim Campos guy? He says, Tim Campos, you know, don't hire Tim Campos. And the hiring manager's like, why not? And he's like, because I want to hire Tim Campos. <laughs> Anyways, that got me in the door. The rest of it was uh, Facebook's a very technical place. Yeah. And certainly in 2010, uh, even in leadership roles, even for a function like IT, they were looking for somebody who, you know, could spell IT, um, but also could code. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, so I, I had a very technical interview and I loved that, uh, for me, that was, you know, this, this was, this was heaven. I was finally getting appreciated for one of my strengths and, um, you know, which is, I'm good at business. I'm good as a leader and I'm technical and, uh, Facebook really was seeking that. And, uh, it was just a, a, a good match. I, I think it's interesting because there are different levels. I've, owned a web agency for 13 years, 14 years, something like that. And we've done work from small mom and pop the whole way up to some Fortune 100 work. I found it interesting, the people we would work with, who some of them had the vision and the leadership, but not the technical skills. And some had the technical skills and did not know how to work with people whatsoever. Uh, And even in our own team, I, I, I code and also led teams and and so I get that kind of marriage of being able to lead and also see the vision and be able to create, but also to get in there and get your hands dirty in the code that you're writing. How were you able to keep relevant with what was going on? Because you had a lot of responsibilities and, and to stay up on current trends, to stay up on, on the evolution of these technologies and these code bases while leading a team, that's, that's a hard balancing act between the various elements of your job. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I um, personally have experienced that you, you don't have to have all the skills to be successful in in a role. You just have to know what you're good at and what you're not and surround yourself with people that can compliment you. Um, so to your specific question, I had a great staff. I learned quite a bit from my staff. Mm. Um, and uh, that was probably the, the primary source of um, information on technical trends and, and what was going on. It's just, you know, what was going on with my team. Uh, yeah, on top of that, uh, you know, I like to read. I, um, I'm, I'm more of the, my wife makes fun of me anytime I fly something new, whether it's a car, a computer, whatever, I <laughs> rip out the owner's manual and I read it end to end and figure out all the nifty little tricks it can do it. with, uh, you know, any kind of new tech that's out. Um, you know, there's with, with one of the fantastic things about the internet. It's so easy to um, pick up what's new and different. So, uh, those are probably the, the two primary sources. Um, Facebook made it kind of easy, uh, to stay on top of things because it was leading so much yeah. in uh, a lot of technology development. Uh, you know, was, Facebook did a lot of open source, uh, development for everything from, you know, database technology all the way to the hardware and the data centers. And the other thing is that as a, I think one of the most interesting aspects of the CIO role is that it requires you to be a learner. You yeah. can't really be successful without having a passion for understanding new things. Uh, when you go in and you talk to the, uh, you know, the head of recruiting, uh, you know, you, you really need to be passionate about understanding how do they do their jobs? How does the recruiter recruit? What is, what are the key things that take time? Um, where are the automation opportunities? And if you don't have that passion, you're not going to look for the things where you can make a difference. Um, 
And, you know, that's always been something that's really interesting for me. Uh, when we go into the data centers and understand how Facebook ran the data centers and how did the repair techs do their jobs and what are the long poles there? And um, oftentimes it's the things that are not obvious where you can make the, um, you know, the, the biggest difference. Like, you know, in the case of data center repairs, uh, you know, one of the big issues was walking from <laughs> where the server is to where the parts are. Yeah. So instead of having a person who's trying to fix a, a machine uh, that's down, walk to the machine, diagnose it, realize, oh, that we have a hard drive failure, then walk back to the parts depot, come back and replace the drive. If we could build automation that would allow them to do a lot of the diagnostics remotely and then walk the server aisles with all the components that they need to uh, perform the repair in a cart, with them now they can repair a lot more equipment because they're spending less time walking who'd have thought right yeah um, and, make it and much this, more of a, a productive experience where uh you're not making redundancy of walking down that aisle a big long aisle i'm sure uh to the parts place to the the depot uh killing out that redundancy must well it cuts the time significantly yeah i mean a, a, another trivial example um for our sales organization, we um, were looking at uh, the expense reporting process. That was one of the things that they were complaining was taking a lot of time. And as we looked into the details of the expense reporting process, uh, the, the issue that was taking the most time, it would it literally take uh, 10 to 20 times as long to complete an expense report that had a hotel stay in it as uh, an expense report that didn't have a hotel stay. Yeah, And we could measure this by looking at when the expense report was created and when was it submitted. And um, the issue was line item, the itemization of the hotel receipt of, you know, oh, this is, you know, how much I paid for food and this is how much I paid for the hotel and this is how much I paid for something else like a movie I might have bought or something like that. And the reason we, uh, the, that was being captured was to address um, the risk of, somebody like spending the company's money in an inappropriate way, which was solvable in other ways that didn't require so much upfront investment by the salesperson. I mean, it was basically we were taxing the entire sales organization to solve the finance problem. Yeah. Solve the finance problem in a different way and um, everybody's happy. And so, you know, when we announced this one change to the sales organization, that we were no longer going to require this uh, line itemization of hotel receipts. It was amazing the response. This was at a sales conference, and I literally got a standing ovation. <laughs> I thought the sales organization was going to rush the stage. <laughs> you became the rock star of the moment. Yeah. I mean, I was announcing a whole <laughs> bunch of really advanced tech things that were, you know, taking months of time of engineers to build and, you know, really cool stuff. But the thing that they most locked on to was that hotel itemization and it really just got down to where people's productivity drains are are not always in the um you know the really interesting fun tech areas but sometimes they're in the obscure uh things that require you to really understand how people are spending their time like yeah. walking the data center aisles or filling out expense reports finding the pain and and pulling the thorn absolutely I, I, I'm noticing a trend here in, in your story as you've explained kind of your journey into the world of technology and then into the world of working at Facebook. And it's, it's the same thing I've found with people that have worked for me who have been coders, who have been uh, even project managers or project leads, is that the ones that excel have a common thread of curiosity. They're not necessarily going to college – because they're going to learn something awesome. It's stuff that they would already be going and trying to explore and discover on their own. They're, or you in your case, these are things that you would want to learn and understand and, and rip apart from cover to cover. Talk to us a little bit about curiosity and a process of problem solving, because that's what you're talking about when you're talking about the, the repair process or the itemization of items from uh, the, the sales department, you're talking about curiosity to discover solutions. So talk to us about that process. Yeah. I mean, and I, I think when I've like 
gotten into the depth of this question, why am I the way that I am uh, on this front? Uh, I've, I've figured out a, a, an answer for me. I don't know if other people are this way, but it's a, a bit counterintuitive. That uh, mm. you know, it starts with um, the premise of your question, which is I, I do believe that curiosity is a is a core ingredient to problem problem solving. You have to have a real passion and 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 desire to understand before you can fix. Um, when you approach a problem with the solution already in mind, uh, you know, whether we're talking about a, a technical issue or even a sociological issue, yeah. uh, you've already kind of lost, yeah. right? Diagnosing uh, before you discover. Yeah. And, and so, and it's the, the uh, I used to describe insights as um, information that is counterintuitive, that gives you a counterintuitive result. Like people would, would look for data and reports largely to confirm a belief that they have. Like, oh, and if the if the data doesn't say what they believe, then they would be quick to dismiss it. Oh, something's mm-hmm. wrong with that data. Letting the bias data drive they, their decisions. Yeah. But that is exactly the opposite of what you want. The, the best data is going to tell you something that is counterintuitive yeah. because then it's going to lead to – an intervention, an action that you wouldn't have otherwise taken. And that's usually where uh, the, you know, the, the real innovations begin. So it, 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 uh, it, it starts with curiosity. For me, I found that the source of that curiosity is a desire to like maintain control over my universe. And not, not to get mm. too deep, but you know, having grown up in an environment where there was often a lot of chaos – um, the, uh, you know, I, I sort of built up this desire to maintain some level of control over the things that I could in order to feel more comfortable with the chaos that was going on in the things that I could. I moved a couple of times as a kid and, you know, kind of a, a, a chaotic childhood and, and that desire to control led me to technology, particularly to programming. Like programming, I thought, was uh, this most amazing thing. Here I could write down in code, if this, do that. And wow, imagine if I could apply that to all aspects of my life, in which, you know, as uh, an industry, we have started to do so. We've started to build cars that can drive themselves and computers that can make a lot of decisions for us. Uh, So we've really extended that. But um, that desire to have some... Uh, control over my uh, my environment is what sort of built up this desire, this this curiosity, this innate curiosity. And once you have that, then uh, if you're really seeking the the truth, and you you have a passion for what is counterintuitive, or you're you're looking for what is counterintuitive because you see that as an opportunity. There's just you know, tons and tons of, of opportunities to make make a big difference. Um, I remember at the, one of the companies I worked at, when, um, a startup that I worked at, um, one of the issues that we were running into was a performance problem. Mm. And uh, you know, we, uh, this is back in 1999, 2000, and this was a, an early software as a service company. So if we had customers in Europe and the data center was in California, like the latency between those two locations created a huge problem. Right. So if the app was too big, it would, you know, it wasn't a, an easy way to solve this problem. Um, and one of the engineers in a different team, who didn't report into me, had um, written a, a paper on HTTP compression. Hmm. And uh, it had been completely dismissed by his management team and uh, you know, sort of thrown along on the wayside. And as we were solving this performance problem, I was just looking for anything that was like a, a different way to address the issue because everything that we were doing wasn't working. Right. And I found this paper on that he'd written on, on HTTP compression. I looked at this. I'm like, oh my God, why are we ignoring this? This is, <laughs> this is, there's so much opportunity in here um, to, if we just reduce the size of the payload, there's less data to move. And of course it's going to perform better. And uh, it was, a technology that was well adopted by browsers. Anyways, long story short, that turned out to be one of uh, a few key things that helped us address our productivity issues. And it got the light of day because of you know, the, 
this desire to to really seek the uh, counterintuitive result. Um, so that's always worked out for me. Now, typically in the episode, we would move towards three questions in this segment. I, I want to hold off on those because we haven't gotten to the place where those are the right questions to ask yet. Instead, I, I want to ask you some questions about uh, Facebook as we wrap up this first segment. The first question being, as a person who's worked inside of Facebook, there there's a lot of maybe contempt, whether it's a government contempt against Facebook right now or individuals who are curious about how their privacy is impacted by Facebook or how their information is used or how they're seeing the content. Can you give us an insider's perspective on what you would want people to know about what's your interpretation of Facebook and how you view it as a company? Well, I start from the outside, which is how does Facebook influence us? Yeah. And it's different from other technology companies. You take, you take Google, uh, a company which is older than Facebook and just as permeated into our lives. And yet people don't um, have the same reaction to Google that they do with Facebook. Um, why? And the, it comes down to the fact that Facebook is a product that has we have an emotional connection to mm -hmm. like when you go to facebook you see photos of your friends and your family or you'll see you know maybe some uh, stuff on politics that you know gets you all amped up and even the way that the algorithms work are designed to follow your emotions uh, well because, if you're if you're tying emotion into what you're seeing you're going to have people more engaged with the content that's exactly right. That's exactly right. You're much more likely to be engaged if you are emotionally connected to the content, both on a positive and a negative side. Right. And so this creates an emotional connection to Facebook that's not always positive. I think in the early days, it was easy for the emotional connections to be more positive than negative because you were connecting with friends that you hadn't met with in, over a long period of time, or you, Facebook would be the place where you go to you know, announce the fact that you're getting married or you had a child or something like that. And these would be really positive things. But as time has gone on, it's gotten more connected to other parts of our lives, which include some of the more negative side of things. Yeah. And like po political debate, I think, is, a, is just one example of this. And um, so it a lot of people have a negative emotional connection to Facebook. And that's not new. That's been going on for a while. It's an issue the company has struggled with. Um, and then you add on top of that that the kind of information that Facebook has about us is very intimate. Yeah. Right? And we're not talking about like, you know, the uh, websites that uh, I, I go to or the YouTube videos of cats that I watch. We're talking about <laughs> you know, my photographs and my friends and my life and where I am. And so we care about what Facebook does with our information. So all those things are just facts that are uh, understandable from the outside. When you get to the inside, Facebook truly, at its core, has a belief that, one, making the world more open and connected is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and two, that uh, you know, it is uh, being a good steward of user data. Mm. Um, it believes that. And – all the decisions that it makes, it makes under the context of that belief, even when they're somewhat flawed. Um, and so uh, the where I think we get into a real interesting conversation with Facebook is the fact that um, being inside of the company is very different than being on the outside. You know, I don't want to say that Facebook is a cult because it's not. <laughs> but you do get a different perspective when you're talking with other Facebook employees all the time than when you're outside of the company and you don't have any connection into the company. Right. Uh, but you see the impact that the company is having. And I yeah. think it is difficult for their, for Facebook then to be totally introspective and understanding of how people see it. It's a bias by um, proximity. Because it's, it's got a very biased view of, of itself. Um, so all those things, I think, make Facebook a very complicated product in, in our world today. Um, and, you know, it's, it's fitting on top of other broader technology trends and how that affects, affects society that uh, uh, is probably a much deeper conversation um, that, that also affects these things. But, uh, but in the end, uh, I can say this. It, 
nobody, especially Mark Zuckerberg, uh, that I worked with at Facebook has any malintent. Mm. You, know, you don't have a bunch of, of employees who come to work who are like, oh, I want to make a lot of money <laughs> stealing people's data and selling them that to other people. I have yet to meet anybody in the company who, who's ever thought that way. It's not a malicious uh, intent. It's it's no, a side they, effect they, of, of the reality of the systems. If they – if they've done things that are perceived as malicious, it's mistakes or mm. it, they are, um, yeah, a side effect of, um, you know, an unintended consequence of a, a well-intended uh, desire. And the, the people at the company are both really, really smart and really, really well-intentioned and truly believe that they are uh, making the world a better place. And, and where Facebook fails to do that, it's more than anything because it's kind of hard to see the impact that you're having when you're inside the company in a, in complete terms. I want to wrap up this segment with one final question that's on the broader scale of uh, connectivity and technology's responsibility in our life. And that is, I often say that technology has given us a sense of false intimacy without the responsibility and, and and I think that's truer even in the say, uh, sense of social media from the standpoint of it's easy in the world of social media and connectivity to feel like we have an intimacy that's not really there. We're consuming each other as data, as information, and I know you love data. And and then we lose the responsibility to each other that was built into the fabric of community through whether it was civil uh, organizations, whether it was churches or other community-based organizations, we, we've gotten more connected, but in that we've lost the sense of responsibility to each other. And how can we reconcile that? I, I'm sure my bias is speaking here loudly, but I, I think it's something that we struggle with of like, how do we start really bridging the gap between digital connectivity and face-to-face -face connectivity and and that that authentic place of intimacy instead of just viewing people as information yeah i think this is a, this is a great 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 question i mean uh in in multiple board meetings in different places in my life i've, I've often heard people point out a fact that they have all noticed which is in public settings, it used to be like if you got on the subway or you got on the bus, mm. you'd basically sit down next to other people and, you know, you basically have a choice. You could either sit there and be quiet and stare at the wall or you talk to these people. Um, and oftentimes that would be an opportunity to meet somebody that you wouldn't otherwise meet. And in today's world, when you get on the subway, nobody talks to each other. They're all staring at their phones. <laughs> right. And, you know doing whatever they're doing on their phones. Oftentimes it's social media, not, not entirely, but it, it's what that really demonstrates is the lack of connection that we have in the real world. Mm. And yet it's the real world that matters. Yeah. Um, and so I think there's a part of it where you just kind of have to consciously turn it off. Mm. You know, when I sit down at dinner with my kids, we, we have very firm rule of no screens at the table. Um, you know, the phones go in the, in the middle of the table and it's kind of a competition of like who can keep their hands off the longest. Um, <laughs> and, uh, it makes a difference because then we can sit down and truly talk to each other yeah. and everybody's staring at their phones. It's, um, yeah, it's just, it, it, there's, you, you lose that connection. But I think the other thing that, um, what digital technology has enabled is a way for us to connect with what's familiar and what we like really yeah. easily. And yeah. that's overall a good thing, right? You know, if I, if I like the outdoors and I like hiking and I, digital technology makes it easy to find websites of where I can learn about places I might want to go hiking and talk to other people who care about that stuff. All that's good. But sometimes it's helpful to learn about things that you don't like. Mm. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll go to, politics as an example. It, it, if I only spend time learning about the political things that I agree with, and I never take the time to learn about the things that I completely disagree with, then I can't have empathy or concern for people who believe those things. Yet we all live in the same country. So if I take the time to go and learn about the stuff that doesn't make any sense to try to understand it, to be able to build the argument and, and you know, 
good debaters always understand both sides of an argument, um, then you build at least a little bit of empathy. It doesn't mean you have to change your mind, but you can understand why somebody else would believe something different than, yeah. than you do. And I think that's kind of missing from our world right now. Yeah. We have become very divided because we're choosing to be in the places that are comfortable and not putting ourselves in the places that are uncomfortable. And while I think that is good to a point, um, there's a lot of life in, in my experience that comes from putting yourself in those uncomfortable positions. Yeah, we recently had a guy named Buster Benson on the show, and he's written a book called Productive Disagreement or The Art of Productive Disagreement. I think that we're missing that because it's easy to get into our walled gardens, exactly what you're talking about, and not have discussions that really matter and have discussions yeah. that cause us to think and rethink and, and be challenged to actually process why we believe what we believe. Yes, right. Completely agree with you. We're going to take a break right here. And when we come back, we're going to talk to Tim about Woven, how Woven started, and what they're creating. We'll be right back. In a moment, we're going to be back to continue our conversation with Tim Campos. Before we do that, I want to take a moment and wish you a very Merry Christmas, a happy Hanukkah, uh, an incredible holiday season. It's my favorite time of year. I actually love the whole season from Halloween the whole way through New Year's. I, I could put that on repeat every year. I hope that you're doing something special to celebrate, spending some more time with family and friends to reflect in, on what you have to be thankful for to really stop and think and enjoy this season. So Merry Christmas, happy Hanukkah. I wish you a very incredible holiday season. Now let's jump back into today's conversation with Tim Campos. We are back with Tim Campos. All right, Tim, before we dive into the conversation about Woven, people need to know how they can find and connect with you and Woven. So can you let them know what are the best ways to connect? Yeah, uh, um, well, first our website, woven.com. And you can learn uh, a lot about uh, uh, us and my co-founder and I, my team and the company, um, what we're doing. Um, and then uh, for me personally, I also um, you know, have a Twitter feed, uh, T Campos, um, and you can learn more about me there. From the, our first segment, I mean, there's so much we could go into, and we want to make sure to talk about Woven. I know that Woven was sparked out of necessity from a situation that happened at at Facebook and and really started you thinking about the, the pain points and problems and causing a solution there to solve that. So tell us a little bit about that origin story of Woven and, and the problem that you're solving. Well, ultimately, um, what got my interest in this space, which is uh, calendaring or managing time, is running out of it. Um, you know, my, my job at Facebook was the productivity of the workforce yeah. and, um, productivity, uh, one way to define it is how much work are you able to complete, um, uh, over the amount of time that, that you have to complete that work. And, uh, time is finite. Uh, mm. you know, if, if, if you were to define it by, um, how much work can you get done based on, uh, the number of people that you have, you can always get more work done by having more people. You can just grow your workforce. Right. But when it comes to yourself, um, you know, the only way that people can adjust their time is to make different choices about how they're going to spend it. There's no other time that they can get. Um, in, a, in a day. It's only 24 hours in a day. Right. And I found for myself that by the time I got to Facebook, this wasn't unique to Facebook, but meeting culture had become so dominant in corporations that my <laughs> schedule was booked. Yes. 100%. Yes. And it was to the point that if I didn't book into my schedule time to do certain things like go to the doctor or even read my email that they didn't, those, that time wasn't there anymore. It didn't get done. I would, I would get booked meeting with somebody else. And this was counterproductive that if I didn't meet with anybody in my job, I wouldn't get anything done. At the same time, if I met with people a hundred percent of the time, I wouldn't get anything done. There would be no way <laughs> right. to follow up from those meetings. Right. 
And so there's an optimal point in there. And so then I started looking at, well, great. How do we find this optimal point? Well, it starts with, like you said earlier, I'm a data guy. Let's get the data. What does the calendar say in terms of how I'm spending my time? That's when this whole thing starts to fall apart. You can't ask the calendar this question. It doesn't have it, – it's not only that it doesn't know. <laughs> it doesn't have a mechanism to query. Yeah. So even if it did know, there's no way to say select star from my calendar where uh, you know, meeting type is important or meeting type is uh, uh, you know, working with uh, my team um, or working on this kind of project. It doesn't have the ability to answer those kinds of questions. And uh, on top of that, you know, even though the calendar is a tool to make decisions on how to allocate time, it has absolutely zero intelligence to make those decisions for you. It's just storing data. Yeah, it is. The calendar is the digital representation of a paper diary. Yeah, that is that's its history. That's where it came from. That's what it does. That's its value in the universe. So it's very good at telling you what you have scheduled. Where am I going next? And that's it. It's not good at scheduling. You have to have a person do that work. Uh, in my most of my uh, uh, career, I've had uh, executive assistants, uh, administrative assistants help with that. Mm -hmm. It's a complete waste of people's time to do nothing other than stare at a screen and see where there are open spots and then write emails to tell other people these are the spots that would work. Right. Uh, so all this you know, gave – life to this idea that maybe there's a better calendaring system. Um, the thing that really tipped the balance for me is when I f first got to Facebook running into the operational problems of the calendar where, you know, within a couple of weeks coming to the company, I had an urgent call to, uh, have a meeting with, uh, with Zuck, um, you know, at eight in the morning, uh, by his EA, uh, and I thought that the meeting was going to be about strategy for yeah. IT. And it turned out to be an ambush by the senior EAs in the company to tell <laughs> me that the calendar was broken, meetings were falling off the calendar, conference rooms were getting double booked, and that this was causing huge embarrassment for the senior leaders. And if this didn't get fixed quickly, that you know my job was, was done. Hmm. Um, and for my first year at Facebook, it felt like every time I met with an executive, I would spend the first 50 to 75 percent of the meeting talking with them about calendaring problems that they had or that their EA had and what we were going to be doing about them to, to fix it. And it, this was totally unproductive for me. Solving those problems or having to solve those problems was it, it was like, you know, making sure that the door locks work. Um, you know, you kind of expect that you can lock the door and that your card key will unlock the door when you walk in the door. You don't want to spend a lot of time thinking about that. Right. But we had to. Yeah. Um, and and getting into it, as I said earlier, I'm an engineer. So taking the calendar apart and understanding how it's built, it's not built in a way where it can solve these things. Calendars are based off of email. Right. And email is not designed to do the things that we want it to, to do today. Email is the digital representation of the paper memoranda. <laughs> uh, so basically we're walking around trying to manage our lives, trying to make decisions about the most critical aspect of our time using a technology that was designed in the 80s to distribute memoranda digitally. Mm -hmm. Like that doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. And so – uh, you know, as my co-founder and I thought about this more and more, we're like, this is a huge problem and there's huge opportunity to make a big difference here to rethink how this thing is built. And that's what woven is about is to really change, not just what the calendar can do, but really how it's built so that it can do much bigger parts, uh, much bigger things in our lives. And it, it starts with simple stuff. You know, we're, let's get meetings scheduled more efficiently. But the long-term vision for us is to have the calendar be an active manager of our time, mm. just like other technology is for us. You know, the way that you know the Apple News application brings the news that is most interesting to me so that I can read it, or how um, you know the uh, Facebook does a you know good job of helping me see the stories that are going on relative to all, all of my friends. The calendar should really present the information about how I need to spend time to me to make better decisions about uh, time management and time time decisioning. And that's what we're building with Logan. I know there are tools out there that do 
scheduling and calendar management to an extent of like, here's my acuity link, here's my uh, calendry link. How is Woven different from what they're doing? And are you, a lot of those are, are more focused on individuals. Are you more focused on the corporate side or do you work also in the, the space for individuals managing their schedule outside of a corporate structure? The thing that makes us most different is that to make Woven work, we have completely rebuilt how the calendar manages information underneath the covers. On the surface today, if you go use Woven, you're going to see some things that look very familiar. A calendaring user interface that looks not much different than what you get with Google Calendar or with Fantastical. Um, But underneath the covers, that calendar is much more capable. It has the ability to understand the kinds of events that you have and to help you create them. So when I create a dinner meeting, it can automatically populate the location that I want to have for dinner. Mm. Um, Or when I create a a call that, you know, it will put my cell phone uh, number in there for somebody to call me. Um, When we look at things like scheduling, there's features that we have that are very similar to like Calendly or Acuity, where you go to a link and that allows you to see the time that is available on my calendar so you can schedule an event. But uh, again, underneath the covers, the way that that is um, put together is this really sophisticated graph engine that can look across not just my availability, but other people that I put into that event to present back the options that uh, are work for all of us to schedule that event. So it's really, really simple for the other person to just say, oh, yep, that, that side works and we'll just get this um, scheduled with one click. These capabilities start looking similar, but when you look at how our roadmap evolves in terms of the type of things that we're adding to the calendar, there is a capability that Woven has that nobody else does because of the back end that we have built. And so as we get into things like, how do I make sure that I'm properly prepared for a meeting? Well, I want to make sure that an agenda is defined before Mm. this meeting occurs. Woven can do that. When we say, oh, let's give others not just the ability to choose the time, but how about the location? Woven has the ability to do that. We say, oh, we just had this event. Can we uh, decide, can we you know, just keep track of everybody's feedback? Was this a good meeting or a bad meeting so that I can incorporate that into how I run my meetings in the future and others can incorporate that into whether or not they want to attend my meetings? Woven has the ability to do that. I mean, to start talking about action items and follow-up events that need to occur from this meeting that I just had, uh, Woven has the ability to do that. So we are um, a small company, so we can't realize the vision that we have in one fell swoop. But over time, you'll see that Woven is just more and more differentiated from the So uh, going through your Twitter feed, one of the things I noticed is back in September, you were announcing the launch of a new phase of Woven. Tell us a little bit about how you're evolving and choosing what needs to roll out, when it needs to roll out, and how that impacts your customers. This is the hardest part of the job today. Um, I I think it's actually a – it it maps to a general issue that uh, exists in life when you have a lot of different um, options uh, it's hard to pick the best one Mm. Uh, and uh, in our case there's so many different things to do with the calendar that prioritization is the biggest challenge of running running the company Uh, we tend to prioritize based on um, uh, things that are going to help us grow and achieve our vision in the future so you know for for now we're very focused on scheduling as a problem, not because that is where we want to end up, mm. but because um, scheduling is the pain point that people most identify with on their calendars today. And it helps us get them connected with Woven. We can evolve the company from a scheduling product um, uh, more easily than we can evolve uh, the company from an agenda management product or yeah. um, a, a task management product. So uh, scheduling is the initial journey that um, we um, have focused on. Even there, we're very focused on the 
individual scheduler. So instead of going after companies, we've gone after um, uh, you know, people who are busy, yeah. whether you work at a company or not. Okay. And um, for those people, we found that the people that don't have executive assistants are the one, ones who are the most hungry for those problems. Mm. So that's given us our initial focus. As we evolve, we want to connect to more people. You know, Woven is a more valuable product and more people who are using it. And not everybody has the same scheduling problem. So we'll move from a product that helps you get the events on your calendar to a product that helps you spend that time more effectively. Um, and uh, that will include things like uh, helping people uh, track and manage agendas, track and manage follow-up actions, share that um, with other people to make the calendar more of an active um, document or uh, information element and not just this passive thing that tells you where to go. So it sounds like to an extent it is solving some of the solutions that Slack is attempting to solve for messaging uh, and communication and doing that for the calendar space and then growing into doing much more than that. Yeah, it's a, it's a good analog because if you look at Slack – Slack has um, – it's a communication technology. Right. And the te technology that Slack has most impacted is email. Yes. Email was being overused, used not for memoranda but for like the little quick questions like, are you there? Um, <laughs> and so uh, – and also like for spam and other things. And Slack gives us a better way of managing the communication to put things into channels, to connect it with teams that you're collaborating on, put it around subject areas. Um, and so it, it makes communication more efficient. It doesn't entirely kill email. You still need email for certain things, but it's a lot better for a, a lot of other stuff. Woven is reimagining the calendaring use case um, in, in a similar fashion. Um, I think in our world, what is different than Slack is – Instead of just trying to narrow the calendaring communication, we're really trying to expand what the calendar is connected to to make yeah. the calendar not as isolated so that you know, the, the podcast that you have has the briefing notes uh, associated with it more directly. That um, the uh, agenda that you have for your staff meeting is maintained in the calendar event. Um, and that makes the events more – uh, useful, more valuable, and also with time, um, more intelligent, because if the calendar understands what you're doing in the event, now it can do a better job of helping you prioritize uh, the allocation of time. Go on over to woven.com, check out what they're doing. It's super cool stuff. As we wrap up the second segment, I want to know, how are you finding purpose in what you do? Oh, this is easy. This is, um, uh, you know, for when I was at Facebook, one of the reasons that I stayed there as long as I did and why I love the company is I, I, I believed in the mission mm. of connecting people. Um, and for Woven, um, the mission that we have is helping people spend time on what matters most. And it is a fact that we that there is only 24 hours in a day for everybody. What time, how you want to allocate your time is different than the way that I want to allocate mine. Yeah. But the decision to allocate our time on what is meaningful for us is a, is something that we share. And so, you know, for me, for you, maybe it's to spend time with your family or to grow your business for, for me, it may be, you know, I'm really passionate about having an impact on the community in addition to growing my business. Um, these choices that we make, they make a difference in people's lives. And for me, I am motivated to wake up every day and build a tool, a technology that can help people make those choices more effectively. And I don't see that as a small little problem where we, you know, we, we kind of optimize scheduling a little bit and, and then cash out and, and sell this to somebody else. I see this as a huge problem that can have a big uh, impact on people's lives. And that's what we're trying to have. What is one challenge you're currently working to overcome with what you're building? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the prioritization challenge is a, uh, is a big one. Um, I think the other thing that is really interesting for us, we're, we're working on new ways to um, prototype and get feedback from users uh, quickly. 
that mm. uh, it's expensive to build software and yeah. you know to, to code things. By the time it's coded, it's kind of like you poured the concrete, and mm. you can polish and move things around, but it's kind of already set. But at, on the flip side, it's it, uh, woven is a data product, meaning that I can show you a picture of a calendar and you can give me some feedback on whether that's pretty or not. But um, it's not useful without your data in, in it, without your uh, meetings and your events. And so uh, that makes it um, more challenging for people to, to, to prototype um, the technology um, without having to build more of it. And we're working on some new ways to overcome that challenge so that we can get feedback from people quickly without having to completely um, uh, you know, build the software first and then get their feedback. Yeah. Uh, and instead sort of build pieces of it and show them that in action in a way that's meaningful to them, but where it might still be somewhat incomplete. Um, and uh, that should help us move a lot faster as we move forward. And final question in this segment is what is the next big dream idea or goal you have for what you're building? Well, <laughs> I don't know if I need the next one because the one that we're doing is, <laughs> is uh, it's a big, big goal. I mean, helping people spend time on what matters most uh, means that you're helping people spend time. That's a scheduling. You understand uh, what matters most. So that's a little bit of an analytics problem. And then you're fusing those two things together, that you're incorporating the decision on how you want to spend time with the decision to spend time. Uh, and that's a that's enough for me. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> this is what I am really, really focused on these days. And all the th problems that we have to solve along with that, even though they're really big, like this prototyping problem, um, to me, they, um, they're they subordinate to this bigger vision of helping people spend time on what matters most. We're going to take a break right here. And when we come back, it's Rapid Fire Questions with Tim Campos. There is a lot of exciting things happening here at JumbleThink, and 2020 is going to be a really crazy, cool year. We want you to be a part of it, not only as a listener, but we want you to join the conversation on your favorite social media channel like Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Chasing dreams and ideas is hard to do on your own, but when you are a part of a community of other dreamers, of other idea makers just like you, chasing your dreams and ideas becomes a lot easier. So head on over to your favorite place to connect like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, search for JumbleThink, and let's join the conversation with other dreamers just like us to chase those dreams and ideas together. If you want to make it even easier, head on over to JumbleThink.com. You'll find links to our social media channels. You'll find a place to sign up for our newsletter. And of course, you can drop us a note. Let, let us know what you think of the show. Let us know how we can help you. Now let's jump into rapid fire questions with Tim Campos. We are back with Tim to do rapid fire questions. Tim, are you ready? I'm ready. As a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? I wanted to be a pilot. Nice. You going to go get that pilot's license? You could still do it. I'm still working on it. My eyesight's getting a little bit worse, but uh, uh, yeah, that, that is definitely on the bucket list. What is one tip you'd give someone with a big idea or dream and they don't know where to start? start. <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds trite, but when we get, we get stuck on this idea that we have to do things right. Yeah. And really the bigger thing is we just have to do, mm. we have to do things. Um, the right part comes from realizing whether or not you're on the right path and making adjustments. It's fueled by doing. Mm. So just do. What's one change you'd like to see in the world? Mm. I'd like to see us as a society, spend more time trying to understand what we don't, okay. being very willing to look for the things that uh, that we don't believe. What do you want your legacy to be? Well, uh, the problem that I'm working on with Woven, I think this is this is what if if I could retire having solved one thing, it would be that. Uh, even if it, I just make a dent in it, that mm -hmm. would be uh, interesting for for me. Where do you find inspiration? Others, um, you know, and when I say others, I don't just mean the Steve Jobs and Elon Musk of the world. <laughs> you know, I'm 
I'm inspired by by friends, by coworkers, by employees. By I, I'm on the board of this company called uh, Europe, which uh, takes um, uh, uh, underdeveloped uh, young adults and uh, gives them uh, career training and uh, internship opportunities. And the character of these people are incredible, and they're to- the problems that they've had to overcome to be where they are. Um, they're very inspiring for me. They, they help put my life in context that, you know, sometimes when things feel tough, you know, compared to what these guys have had to go through in terms of, you know, providing food for their families or getting into this country or, um, you know, dealing with a safety issue based on where they live. Um, my problems pale in comparison to theirs and they overcame them. Therefore I should be able to stand up to mine. Mm. What is one book you think every dreamer should read? That's a good one. Um, you know, I've just started um, this uh, this really great book. Uh, I'm forgetting the title off the top of my head. Um, it, you have to come back to me on this one. I don't want to get stuck on on thinking about it, but uh, it, I, I will give it to you in the next five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> For you, how do you define success? Happiness. Mm. Uh, at the end of the day, um, if we're doing what makes us happy, that's that's success, um, and I think. That definition makes it possible for everybody to be successful. Deep Work is the name of that book. Okay, Deep Work. Great. We'll put yeah. links in the episode notes to that book so you can go check that out for sure. I've not heard of it, so I'm excited to check it out too. It very much ties to what I'm doing because it gets to this idea that um, – I like to call it maker time and manager time. That the things that we do that will have the greatest impact on life require focus mm. and you have to turn everything else off. Yeah. You and, can't do that to the exclusion of the rest of your life. Um, so you have to manage that. Kind of, and that's in part very yeah. tied to what we're doing. Nice. And we live in a distracted world, so it's very easy to not have focus. What is one trend you're currently excited about? Uh, well, you know, I, I'm very excited about what's going on with 5G, uh, 5G technology. Uh, that I think is going to lead to more connection of devices. That's going to create greater opportunities for automation and uh, productivity. Uh, I've already seen the number of devices that are connected just absolutely explode. And 5G makes it possible for those devices to be connected by other um, things besides just Wi-Fi and with different power requirements. And, uh, there's a lot of interesting things going on in that space. What is one habit you find helpful in your life? Time blocking. <laughs> if I want to get something done, <laughs> block the time on my calendar. Nice. Guaranteed. Makes a huge difference. What is one thing you wish you would have known when you first started out? That the best investment you can possibly make is an investment in yourself. Nice. Whether that's school, whether that's choosing to start your own company, whether that's taking the time to read a book. Best investment you can make is an investment in yourself. If you weren't doing what you're doing today, what do you think you'd be doing? I'd be a pilot. <laughs> <laughs> the exit strategy for when you sell, right, is is become pilot. I'm so jealous of these like Afghan, uh, you know, veterans, the helicopter pilots who get to fly around in Hawaii and <laughs> take people over and see the most beautiful place in the world. And, uh, what a fantastic job! But, Our final question for today is: What is one dream you are still wanting to fulfill in your own life? Ah. Uh, you know, to, to help close the opportunity to opportunity divide. Mm. Um, my success is in part due to the opportunities that others have created for me. Um, mm. I had to walk through those doors that were opened. Uh, I had to make those choices, but others, others helped make them possible. And I would like to see that more people in our world have the same have more have opportunity. You know, some people structurally are not in a position to have the same opportunities that the rest of us have. As we wrap up today's show, we always like to leave our guests to have the final thought. What is your final thought for us today? You know, time is the most valuable asset that we have, so let's yeah. spend it well. Be deliberate about it. Tim, thanks so much for taking time out. I I'm excited to see Woven evolve and grow and change and to see your dream come to reality of how that can change our productivity i i I find it fascinating fascinating and i'm excited to see what you guys create well thank you i've really enjoyed uh your podcast and uh uh, talking this morning and 
I look forward to it. Once again, we want to thank Tim Campos for taking time out and being on the show with us today. You can find links to Tim in the episode notes for today's show. On Tuesday's show, we have a very special Christmas Eve show lined up for you today. And then later in the week next week, our guest is Alex Felice. You're not going to want to miss either of those episodes. Now it's your turn. I believe you're created for something awesome, that the dreams and ideas inside of you matter. So get out there, dream big, and change the world around you. En arrière, sur les côtés. Vous êtes une autre personne. Les mères de famille, les enfants, peuvent également prendre un moment revitalisant. Dans quelques mois, lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique et que vous serez maître de votre corps, vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.